It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this session on the emergent topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance, which is organized, as you know, by Lauren Andreas, Stefan Glöcker, Christian Grisinger, May Hong, R. Palmer, Marcus Stexeter, and myself. And um, uh, today we have a very exciting session. Uh, as, as you probably know, at this stage, uh, you don't have to record or take the, the session because uh, we do it for you, and then it can be it will be distributed uh, through ICMRBS uh, mailing list. This session is sponsorized by Euromar and ICMRBS, and in case you had any question, uh, you may type it in the Q and A uh, functionality of, of the Zoom program, or you can also raise your hand, and in the end, uh, particularly in the in the end of the session, you may be allowed to talk in the more informal. Part of the of the session. That said, um, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you today the first speaker, who is uh, Fleming Hansen. So Fleming did his uh, undergraduate and, uh, and uh, he started his his career in Copenhagen. Uh, he did his undergrad with uh, James Lett in uh, in biophysical chemistry, and then uh, he moved after. Uh, he showed stays uh, to the laboratory of Louis Kay, where he stayed there for four or five years, and uh, very successfully. And then he, he went to the University College London, where he has uh, had several positions, but currently he's a full professor and, and chair of the NMRS spectroscopy. So, I, 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 I mean, I think Fleming is a, is a very nice counterexample for those who believe that uh, NMR is very material technique and uh, methodology can no longer uh, support uh, uh, a young scientist uh, career uh, and uh, as well he then complements the, the methodology that he probably will talk to us uh, with beautiful examples so in the end when you look at his uh, contributions you you can see really how biomolecular NMR uh, thrives in his own in his utmost beauty so with that said I mean uh, Fleming um, just to uh, thank you Okay, thank you very much, Oscar, for this really nice introduction. And, and as a thank you to us, all the organizers for this invitation. I'm going to see if I can manage to share my screen. Um, let's see here. Do, and make them up here. So as, do you all see it? Yeah, yeah. good. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to tell you today is a little story about some of our newest experiments and as NMR as a pulse sequences we have developed to, to as a study as arginines and proteins. And we have focused on as a C13 as detected NMR, which I hope will be um, as a, which I hope will be clear in a bit why we have done that. So first of course, why would we like to study arginine? Well arginine is one of the most yeah, one, is as one is as one of the most as frequently um, um, as observed as a residues in as a protein protein and um, and as a protein as RNA interaction hotspots and 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 as the main reason um, as a to that is um, um, as is as really because this arginine side chain is able to form. Um, 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 he has a lot um, um, as offers different interactions. So the first one is that it can form as a five as a hydrogen bonds. It has as a five as hydrogen bonding sites, um, and it can form as a salt bridges. And here is as one example of for as arginine at fifty two in as a T four lysozyme, where it is as forming one of these as a classical as a side on salt bridges. Um, uh, um, as a, and it can also form as a cation pi interaction due to this little delocalized uh, pi system. And as a pi pi interaction has recently been shown. And as well, it, it has now, it has, um, as now has come up uh, that uh, um, as arginine residues are important for some of these, uh, uh, um, as these, uh, uh, these uh, liquid, 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 as a phase separated media. So what I'm going to start with is to focus on the um, as aliphatic um, as a part of arginine. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that would be the sort of green carbons. 
And it is important to understand that part of the side chain if we want to understand um, 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 as it changes um, um, as it, in there's a confirmation and sampling, for example, up and binding to various sites. Um, so, uh, so as a sort of as from an NMR point of view, when we're studying protein, uh, that means that we would need to have access to uh, to as these sites here, so as to the C13 within the arginine side chain. And, and as many of you um, it might have run its very classical constant time as HSQC. So A has a carbon proton correlation map where you will see one peak for each as a, for, uh, for as each as a proton carbon spin pair. Now, even here for T4 lysozyme, which is a well-behaved protein, is not too big around as a 20 kilodalton. And when we run this on sort of fairly as optimized Leave. Sorry, now I'm back. Um, and even when we run this here on ST4 lysozyme, um, as under sort of fairly as optimized conditions, so that means it's a 25 degrees Celsius and uh, not the biggest magnet, but a fairly uh, good magnet, so 800 megahertz, what you will see is that we have quite a lot of overlap. And if we are to use this spectrum as a basis to go and measure as a relaxation rates and other things and interactions, it would be a fairly, um, a fairly hard. So, um, so there are of course other experiments that we could have used to look at these um, sites, these carbon-13, there would be the carbon-carbon toxic experiments. But again, if we were to measure relaxation rates, it would be a big question about the sensitivity and so on. So what we, we decided to do is to focus um, on, uh, uh, Hermes, on the carbon-13. And initially, what we saw is that for us arginine in particular, but for a lot of, of us, the other side chains as well, that the carbons within the side chains will have a very a distinct as a chemical shift pattern. So when you do NMR, you quickly realize that that means that you can apply a frequency selective pulses. So in this case here for arginine, it means that we can, we can apply a selective pulse on this LSC delta, which is what I will call, it's this green one here, which is in the end. And that is um, the carbon that is only coupled to one other carbon. So that will be coupled to the C delta. In the same way, we can give a selective pulse to the C gamma. And, um, and as although that pulse, although I'll, that pulse might hit the C beta as well. That is not really a problem, as I will show you in a little bit. So this is not um, only useful for us arginine, as you will see there are many other side chains. It's not all of them, but there are a lot of other side chains where you can as identify a here is a terminal carbon, which is only bound to one other carbon, and that it will have a very distinct chemical shift from the next carbon like the second next carbon. And here just some example. But today let's focus on arginine. And here I have the pulse sequence. So what we're going to measure, what we have measured is as a carbon-carbon correlation spectrum. So what we do here, we start on the C delta. Those of you can see my mouse, the C delta is here. We then have a standard classical inep. The only difference is that we will uh, that we will use and uh, use as a selective pulses. So the top row here would be the C delta, like the C C a terminal, and you see it looks very much sorry it looks very much like a standard um, as collation spectrum. So we have an inep, we have chemical shift evolution followed then by an inep where we do as IPAP selection. So let's have a look. This is how it looked with the classical. Uh, proton carbon detected experiment, the constant time HSQC, when we now do a carbon detection, what you will see is that we have peaks that are very well separated. There's essentially no overlap. Um, we have a good signal to noise. And this spectrum here, this 2D plane is obtained in just about the half an hour. Now we have made the situation even a little bit harder here. Instead of going to as 800 megahertz, we have recorded it at as a 600 megahertz. And instead of using, using a 25 degrees, we have just used five degrees so that this 
this, this uh, protein here will act as if it was much bigger in terms of tumbling time. You might look at these lysines here and say this experiment is not really ideal for lysine. Well, the reason is we ha have sort of run it in a constant time mode. And if we increase the constant time by a factor of two, you will see here that the reason we don't see the lysine on the red spectrum is, is as a simply because of the short acquisition time. So changing the constant time, changing acquisition time, you see we're now able to also separate out all these lysine side chains that in a, as a classical HSQC, in a classical um, a carbon proton HSQC will be very hard to observe and as let alone being able to measure anything as a quantitative. So what can we use this for? As I say, this 2D collation map is essentially just a starting point. And one can now imagine a lot of various things you could you could simply go ahead and measure using that as a basis, as a readout. And one of the things I'd like to show you today is how we can use it to measure the three bond scalar scale, the three bond carbon carbon scalar coupling, sorry. And we know that three bond carbon carbon couplings um, report on uh, there as angle spanned by the two carbons that are coupling. So for example, over here to the right, if we are to measure the C alpha C delta coupling, that will report on the angle here is shown as a red arrow. So the angle between C alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And, and as traditionally, and also for arginine, we have shown that this scalar coupling here would follow a standard, a standard coupless relationship that relates the angle of that angle here um, of, of as that as the heat angle to the scalar coupling. And how we did it, we used this um, classical idea of max back sachs I think that's the right order, um, where initially we will transfer magnetization uh, um, as a, from the C delta um, as a, via this first uh, coupling period, we'll transfer it to all the carbons so that are scalar coupled to the C delta. Well, then in the middle here between phi three and four, um, as we will encode the chemical shift of that carbon it's coupled to. And in the end, you just see the standard readout that we had in the previous slides. So let's see how this looks here. Here are two, two examples, um, two arginine residues of T4 lysozyme. And what we will traditionally see is we'll see two peaks it's not that they are red and blue, sometimes they are, one is, is a positive and one is negative. So these two peaks report on the two, the two as a carbons and a scalar coupled. You here see uh, um, um, a as a cross peak to the C alpha, and then we have the standard as diagonal peak to the C delta. If we take the ratio of those two intensities, we can then derive what the scalar coupling is. Some of you might think that this scalar coupling here for the other arginine is a bit on the high side, 5.4, but for as arginine, a three bond carbon-carbon coupling can reach up to about as a six hertz when you are in trans. So it's, it isn't completely possible. Now what is more we see is that whereas R14 seems to be an average of various couplings, so it definitely sample various states, we see that R148 is more like in a rigid, in a more rigid position. And when we look in the structure, that is exactly what we see. We see arginine 14 is sort of surface exposed. That means it has the ability to sample various rhodomeric states and therefore the scalar coupling would be averaged. On the other hand, R148 is forming a nice as a salt bridge with the guanidinium group, but that will in turn stabilize and as a rigidify the side chain. So although it is important that we uh, characterize this beginning of the side chain, this aliphatic part, we see being able to really nail down what is happening up to this guanidinium group here seems very important as well, I mean, simply because it's able to dictate also the behavior of some of the side chain. Now, very briefly, it is this guanidinium group that can form a wealth of different interaction, mainly due to this sort of delocalizer pi system within this guanidinium group. Um, and one might think, well, we have a very nice 
nitrogen proton spin pair. And that means that I could just take my classical nitrogen proton HSQC correlation map and record those. And that is true in some cases. It does require that the proton attached to the nitrogen stays there for like a substantial time. So that means that the hydrogen exchange should be fairly slow. Now that happens at either low pH or if that particular arginine is forming very strong interactions. Now that is not always the case. Uh, quite often these lines would be fairly broad and in particular when you study proteins um, at as a neutral pH. So let's take an example how we do it. What we do like to do instead is to record as a, to record a carbon nitrogen correlation maps. So again, we use these, as, these as selective pulses. We start on carbon, we have a classical as an inept with the red arrow, transfer magnetization from the C zeta, it's called the middle carbon within the guanidinium group, down to the nitrogen epsilon and then transfer back. We ensure that here on the left side that magnetization only goes down by applying a, as a selective reaper pulse just on the in epsilon and then we transfer back. The key advantage of this experiment is that it is not affected in any way by as a proton exchange, by hydrogen exchange with the bulk solvent. Of course, it will take a rather big hit because we start on carbon and we also record on carbon. However, as you will see in many cases, being able to eliminate this in a hydrogen exchange will give us much better spectra. So here's one example, again, T4 lysozyme, which I kept most of it to today. You here see a classical nitrogen proton HSQC correlation spectrum. And that's been recorded at a at a fairly low pH in order to minimize the hydrogen exchange at 28 degrees, oh, sorry, 25 degrees. And this protein has 11 arginines. Uh, each arginine has two anidas, each with two protons. So you can quickly calculate how many peaks I should be able to see, sorry. And this is definitely not what we see. We see a fairly broad spectrum where at most we're able to identify one peak. When we turn our attention to carbon detection, here is the C zeta in eta. What we see is that we have much more information, very and in separated peak out, much higher resolution, and we're able to, to as a quantify a lot of these sites. The first thing that immediately comes to attention or comes to mind here is that some of these arginines will split up into very distinct separate peaks, the two peaks corresponding to the two n etas, while other sites, number 14, you see here in the middle, you see it's more sort of like coalesced into one broad peak in the middle. And that is, that is because of chemical exchange, or in this case, it is due to the rotation. The, this is a restricted rotation around the C zeta in epsilon bond. Now, what does this rotation mean? It means effectively that the two N eta nitrogen will swap place. Yeah. And that would be like a classical, like in a classical, like a classical, classical a chemical exchange, and which will give line broadening. In this case, it's a bit more, it's a, um, it's a bit different in the, in the case, in the sense that the two sites have exactly the same population. It's a two nitrogen swapping place. So we know that the population of the two sites would be equal and be exactly a half. The sort of delta omega, if you were to speak in a chemical exchange language, would be the difference between the two nitrogens and the exchange rate would be the rate of as a rotation. Now, Thinking that this is a symmetrical exchange, we are able to play some quite nice tricks, I think. So the first one is that if we are to create as a double quantum coherence that will span the two nitrogens, then such a coherence will evolve with the sum of the two nitrogen frequencies. 
Um, such a double quantum coherence will therefore be completely insensitive to this symmetrical exchange. If you're in doubt, you can, we can calculate it here. So the delta omega would be 1 plus 2 minus 2 plus 1. So that's 0. Um, and we can easily uh, create such a double quantum coherence. You see this experiment here to the right would create such a coherence from this as a multi-order, this is a multi-order as a longitudinal spin density element here I call 4, C, Z, N, Z, N, Z. The phi 2 pulse here, which is a 90 degree pulse, we can face side by 45 degrees and thereby select this a double quantum X, which as our theory said, should be completely insensitive to this symmetrical exchange. So let's have a look. Here's the comparison. You see the single quantum spectra, which, which, are, which are compared to the proton detected experiment looked quite good. You see now that this double quantum spectrum is much better in the sense that we see now very sharp, isolated, separated peaks for each arginine site within this T4 lysozyme. And we are able to see interactions. We could do interaction studies or measure other things as we have shown previously. Now, obviously this restricted uh, rotation will report on any interactions formed. We saw that those residues that were sort of surface exposed um, were much broader, they were rotating faster, and those ones that were sort of engaged in interaction were kind of split into in as a two distinct peaks. So if we could just measure this rate of rotation, that would give us a direct insight in, into this rotation, into also the interactions formed by each individual artery side chain. So recently we developed this CEST experiment where what we're doing in the first part is that we create the same coherence we had before or the same sort of a density element, the one in yellow here, the four C set, N set, N set, onto which we will do our CEST or the chemical exchange saturation transfer pulse. Now we call it multi-quantum CEST because applying a weak CEST field, a weak LCW field to such a spin density element will indeed excite a large number of different coherences. So we will have zero quantum, single quantum, double quantum, and so on. And the amount to which all these different coherences will be excited will depend on the delta omega on the chain on the chemical shift difference between the two sites, as well as on the rate of exchange, the rate of rotation. So let's see to one example here specifically. So here is the arginine with the two nitrogens that are swapping place. And you will see here's one example of a CES profile. CES profile, we would sort of vary the offset for the CES pulse, scan it through the spectrum. And we see then two dips the two dips corresponds in the slow exchange to where the two nitrogens are. Now, by increasing or changing the cestal saturation field strength, we are able to fit the data and get out the rate of exchange. And here are then two examples again for T4 lysozyme. There's R52 that's forming this classical Sidon salt bridge we see a fairly slow exchange rate of around 21 per second. And then we have the other one, which I can't see the number, which is much faster exchange. It's up to around 530. And you also see here, the CES profile does not show the two dips anymore, but it's more flat. Yet we are able to fit the data. And in general, we can extract exchange rate over a fairly large range from about five per second up to around 1500 per second. Now this is mainly due to the fact that it is a, as a symmetrical exchange. So we know what our PB is, what, what are the populations of the two sites and they are exactly half and half, 50, 50%. Now let me show, as I, as I promised Marcus, let me show some very recent experiments we have been working on. These are just a week or two old um, so 
as we saw, the, the double quantum is completely insensitive to exchange. On the other hand, the zero quantum coherence will be super sensitive to exchange because it's sort of apparent delta omega, apparent chemical shift difference when the side chain rotate will be two times that of the difference between the two nitrogens. So we thought we were going, we were going to measure these zero quantum relaxation rates and they should be very sensitive to exchange. And here is the pulse sequence we just derived very recently. It looks very similar to the CEST sequence. The only difference is that the CEST elements have been swapped out with a standard relaxation period. Here's a tau pi tau pulse and where we do a proton decoupling. And when we now take this very preliminary data, but still very interesting, if we take a free arginine in solution, here's the ratio of, of as a zero quantum to double quantum. What you do see is that we have a very fast relaxation of the zero quantum. In this case, it's a small arginine, a small, arginine small free arginine. It relaxes around 400 per second, 20 degrees. Um, and again, we can analyze, we can fit this curve of the intensity ratio and we can extract what is the rate of rotation. And in this case, for free arginine it, at this temperature, it agrees quite well with what we have from other experiments. So it's our idea that being able to increase the apparent um, delta omega by a factor of two, we are able to push some of the sites into or as a, towards this low exchange regime and therefore be able to observe sites that we couldn't see before. So in the end, may, let me briefly summarize. So we saw that we did a carbon-carbon correlation spectra to gain information on the aliphatic part of arginines. We saw very good resolution, very little overlap. We then have the double quantum uh, arginine experiment, look at the guanidinium group, and even for 19 kilodalton protein, we see each of the sides very well separated and one can, you can sort of just think about the experiments you could do with interactions and so forth. In the end, we did the CEST experiment, multi-quantum CEST, to get the rate of rotation around the C theta in epsilon bond. And I'd finally like to thank all the people who did the work. There's Ruth did carbon-carbon collation, Harry did double quantum, and Gox has been working on the CEST and this last experiment, the zero quantum, and finally, the people who have supported the work. And as Oscar said, there are quite a few of these who have as, active, who have, have as actively supported our sort of method development, including UCB Pharma, the Liverpool um, um, Holmer Trust, and also PPSRC. And as a thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fleming, for this very interesting talk. And there are a couple of questions already. Um, so first, France, which I believe is France Mugo, said, hi Fleming, why are the arginines so well resolved and the lysine are not? I don't know if you partially answered that. Uh, um, yeah, I think he was talking, he must have been talking about, shall I just leave this shared like this? Yeah, 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 leave the share. Right? I yeah. think he's talking about this one here, right? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Uh, well, well, yeah, 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 could be. Yeah. I I think this is what we typically see. There are two lysines that are separated a bit. These two here, K85 and K124, and they are forming some, some sort of interaction. But in general, the lysine side chain is, much, is longer, not as bulky. It's able to flop much more around than the arginine. And I think that is, that is the main reason, I think. It's something we generally see, yeah. Okay, so another question is that, can you comment on the effect upon DNA binding and PTMS on the chemical shifts of arginine, backbone and side chains for a general system? Yeah, so up on RNA, so we have done some binding with as a phosphate and you can see quite large chemical shift changes. Um, so generally you will see, it really depends on the system. And I think the important thing is to now go ahead and measure these in various, various systems. We're currently working on a UMPK kinase that has um, six arginines in the active site. 
but other than that, with the PTMS, um, like the post translation modification, I think they would think about as a methylation. And um, I am not sure if it will break the symmetry. That is something that is still to be it, it explored and what will happen there. I would still think you should be able to, to measure the rotation and see how that is affected. You will still have a half-half in terms of okay. population of the two sides, yeah? Sure. Okay, and then there are a couple of questions that I will merge because they are related. So Grace Royapa asks whether you have considered proton start experiment for a carbon-13 detect experiments. Are there any challenges? And then uh, Philip Mildeke asks whether, can you comment whether these were some protonated samples? Yeah, it's true. All these ones are, are fully deuterated simply because of you want as sharp carbon lines as, as possible. Um, so I think when you go to protonated sample, you would then have, have um, much faster relaxation of the C13. On a small protein, we tested these experiments out initially and you can get the carbon-carbon correlation spectra. You can benefit from the resolution, um, but you do not benefit in terms of signal to noise, I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jeffrey von Carlsen said whether you ask whether you anticipate any kinetic isotope effects on the exchange rate upon replacing uh, hydrogen by deuterium. Uh, yeah, so we have measured hydrogen exchange, and I don't know if he talks about the fractionation factor or if he, maybe he, we can talk about that later is explicitly what he, he means. We have measured hydrogen exchange of the arginine at these various it's sites. It's actually effect, perhaps he means on the deuteration of this arginine, I don't know. Like so we also measured isotope effects and um, use those ones to, to, quant to sort of like qualify what sort of interactions the arginine is, is forming. Now that is still to be published, but that's something I'm happy to talk about too. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Clement Anklin asks whether, well, very interesting talk. Uh, would you see any resolution benefit in N15 detection? Uh, we have not not tried it. To be to be honest, um, we have recorded some of the the classical as a Gerd Wagner's uh, experiment. Um, in 15 detected backbone experiment, we have not done any side chain uh, in 15 detected. It's something that's still to do, to try. Okay, Orse Clelli, uh, hi Fleming, thank you for the amazing talk. Could you maybe tell us how did you assign the peaks of one Indian groups in T4 lysosine? Yeah, um, that was in some of our earlier work from 2013. Um, we will do a, as a toxi toxic spectrum from either either side. So if we have a protein where you do have the backbone assignment, let me see if I can find here, right? If you have a, a protein with a backbone assignment, what you, you can, can do is that you can toxic all the way from C alpha, C beta, C gamma, C delta. You can transfer C delta in epsilon and then record this correlation map here. So you can get your toxi mapped onto the C theta in in eta spectrum. You then compare that with a standard classical CC toxy on the backbone. And that's the way we assigned. Some other fairly bigger proteins, we have assigned up proteins up to as over a 40 kilo Dalton. Some of them we did it with as mutation. We mutated arginine to lysine and so one peak disappear. A bit like some people have assigned as a methyl groups by mutation. Okay, there are at least four more questions, but uh, for the sake of time, I think that we should move them to the informal session and give uh, rise now to, uh, to Antoine. So yeah. thank you very much, Fanny again for, for this very interesting talk. And, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Here. I'll stop sharing here. Okay, then Antoine, you can go ahead and share. And in the meantime, I will introduce you. It's my pleasure today to introduce Antoine Loquet, who's uh, joining us from Bordeaux University there, and also he's affiliated with the CNRS and doing many other things, other affiliations. Um, Antoine has a chemistry degree from ENS in Lyon, where he uh, went on to do a PhD with Anya Bachmann, and he de then did a postdoc with Adam Lange, 
here in Göttingen, um, and then uh, before going back to France to where he is joining us today. And uh, he also just mentioned when I was looking him up on the web that I saw he's now maintaining also this uh, database for structures determined by solid state uh, NMR. So um, just, I'll just do a quick introduction and turn it over. Um, the, what we'll hear today is about yeast cell walls and functional amyloids. So the stage is yours. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Lauren. And of course, I would like to thank all the uh, organizers. So uh, I'm going to uh, present what NMR can tell us about uh, structural biology of functional amyloids involved in signaling processes. And then I will introduce new methodological development using proton detection and solid state NMR on intact uh, pathogens. But uh, let me start by introducing uh, functional amyloids. Uh, amyloids are proteins that can form insoluble aggregates, uh, often associated with characteristic cross-beta structure. Pathological amyloids are well known since they are involved in various uh, neurogenerative disorders and they are often associated with misfolding processes and a loss of function uh, mechanism. However, the villains can also become the good ones and, and amyloids can also be non-pathological but beneficial for the cells. Uh, in fact, most of amyloids actually are not pathological but functional. Uh, nowadays, uh, several thousands of functional amyloids have been identified compared to only a few hundreds of amyloids that are uh, pathological. So in my group, we have a strong interest in functional amyloids involved in uh, various uh, organism and biological processes. Especially, we are interested in amyloids involved in signaling, such as in program cell death uh, reaction. The long-term objective is to understand uh, why nature has optimized the amyloid fold to be so efficient in signaling, and what are the advantages of amyloids compared to globular protein to execute signaling mechanism in particular cases. So I'm going to uh, present you a new system we have been investigating uh, the last couple of years uh, called HEALTH. Uh, HEALTH is a prion. It exists in two different states, uh, a non-prion and a prion state. Uh, the prion state can form aggregate dots in vivo, as seen here in uh, Podospora and Selena, which is a uh, fungus. And we know how to in vitro aggregate the recombinant protein to form uh, fibrils. So we have a nice collaboration uh, since many years with the group of uh, Sven Soap. Uh, he's an expert in, in prion, uh, prion biology. And to make a long story short, uh, HELF is a functional amyloid involved in programmed cell death. Upon aggregation, it can relocalize uh, at the membrane and execute a beneficial uh, cell death. So we have tried to see uh, how far we can go with uh, atomic resolution structure determination of amyloid fibrils. Uh, using HELF and the recent methodology based on fast magic angle spinning combined with the use of height field uh, NMR. Since about a year, so we have installed a, a 0.7 millimeter probe and have an 800 megahertz spectrometer in Bordeaux. Uh, but at that time, we didn't have such a probe, so we went to Lyon to work in a, in a nice collaboration with the group of uh, Guido Pintacuda and the gigahertz uh, uh, spectrometer. So what you can see is a two-dimensional uh, HCH correlation uh, experiment of health. So using a, a first CP uh, proton to carbon and then a CP back to do the proton detection. The protein is uniformly uh, carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 label and importantly is fully protonated. And we only use 200 micrograms of sample to perform this experiment. So the spectrum shows well-resolved line uh, indicative of limited uh, structural polymorphism. So we use a three-dimensional spectroscopy uh, inspired from solution NMR methods, mostly relying on MI detection to perform the sequential assignment. Uh, additionally, the HCCH uh, experiment uh, can bring a very useful uh, fingerprint of side chain resonances. Uh, this is an experiment we are currently using in almost all projects uh, running in the group. And I believe it will become the new standard to establish fast fingerprint. Uh, uh, it's very useful since it gives access to side chain signal and it can be directly compared to the standard fingerprint uh, experiment using proton detection, which is the two-dimensional carbon-carbon uh, experiment. Ah, sorry. So one of the critical steps uh, uh, in solid state NMR has always been the collection of uh, distance restraint. 
Uh, here we use a three-dimensional experiment, so HHCH experiment, we do not detect the first dimension, so we can encode a proton-proton proximity and then transfer to carbon and then transfer back for the proton detection. Uh, here what I'm showing is two-dimensional proton-proton planes from this uh, three-dimensional uh, experiment. Uh, as you can see, the intensity can be quite uh, different uh, between the peaks, but we were conservative and we didn't derive any distance uh, classes. And we put everything at the upper bound of 8.5 Armstrong, but uh, I think it, it's pretty uh, conservative. When you want to determine structure of such uh, amyloid systems, uh, uh, one limitation is the detection of intermolecular uh, proximities that always suffer from uh, first from low sensitivity and then by the presence of strong interaction, like truncate weak interaction, but are usually the intermolecular uh, dipolar couplings. So we develop a new approach uh, based on uh, asymmetric labeling and the use of different level of deterioration. So basically we use an equimolar mixture of fully protonated proteins at natural abundance and then we co-aggregate with deuterated, amide reprotonated, and uniformly N15 label protein. So it's, uh, it's easier to see here. So it's an equimolar mixture. So 50% of the sample before the aggregation is fully protonated at natural abundance. And then we mix with pair deuterated protein N15 label that are reprotonated on the amide uh, side. And the experiment we perform is a three-dimensional uh, experiment, HHNH uh, experiment. So we probe the proton-proton proximity, and then we do a CP to nitrogen, and then a CP back to proton for the proton detection. So it's a, a biochemical trick because with this asymmetric labeling, we are able to specifically detect uh, intermolecular uh, restraint. So that's what we use on, on the health protein. What you can see here is two-dimensional planes of, of the three-dimensional uh, experiment to detect intermolecular uh, restraint. So using this uh, intramolecular and intermolecular restraint, as well as the chemical shift, we determine the structure of, of the health amyloid fibrils uh, at high resolution. So uh, it's a very high resolution for solid state NMR. It's about 0 0.8, uh, uh, 0 0.8 Armstrong uh, backbone uh, uh, RMSD. And the structure is formed, uh, so it forms a beta solenoid with two repeats uh, uh, that you can uh, see here. So I'm not going to say too much uh, about the structure since, since we are mostly interested by the biology of the system more than the structure itself. Uh, although it was a very good model for us to see how solid state NMR can solve high resolution structure of amyloid fibrils, uh, so based on proton proton uh, restraint and proton uh, detection. So we solve the fold of health, uh, which is highly comparable to HETES. Uh, HETES is another prion and the structure was solved some time ago in the group of uh, Bert Meyer, also using a uh, solid state uh, NMR. So a very interesting experiment and it was highly surprising for us is the fact that HETES and health do not cross seed. And this is something we have tested in vitro and also in vivo directly in Podospora and Selena. So although they are both from the same organism, they share the same structure. This is what we have demonstrated by solid state of, uh, NMR. However, they uh, only share 17% uh, of sequence uh, identity. So in order to explore this aspect of sequence to fold conservation of the beta solenoid uh, structure, we have tried to investigate how far we can go with low sequence homology to still maintain the prion behavior, uh, importantly, to still keep a structural uh, homology. So we design a minimal uh, prion, we call it head, so for HETES distant prion, and we engineer the uh, sequence to only keep a very low score of sequence homology, so it's 5% compared to HETES. Okay, so between head and HETES, we have 5% of sequence uh, identity. Of course, it's, it's easy to change amino acid on a sequence to reach a score of 5%, but the point here, the important point is to change the amino acid, but to still keep the amyloid behavior and the prion functionality. And this is what we manage. Actually, head can form in vitro fibrils, and it's also form a prion uh, in vivo. Uh, we perform solid state uh, NMR to rapidly derive the, its secondary structure. And I think that's typically 
Uh, here that uh, solid state NMR combined with proton detection is a very powerful approach since we can derive this secondary structure information using a minimal amount of spectrometer time and, and analysis. So we could show that the amyloid fold can adapt to an extreme level of amino acid substitution. And in that case, we even reach the so-called midnight zone of sequence homology. So it's less than 10% uh, of sequence uh, homology. So it's something that was demonstrated a long time ago for globular protein. And to the best of our knowledge, it's here the first experimental demonstration, but it is also true for this class of protein, so the, the amyloid fold. Next, we wanted to see if by increasing the sequence homology, we could breach uh, the seeding uh, barrier. So we engineer another chimeric prion and we call it uh, HEC. So for HETES, close a prion. So HEC is a, is a chimeric protein. We increase the sequence identity to 40% to HETES. And it was uh, uh, amazing to observe that uh, our engineer sequence finally could now breach the seeding barrier so HEC can cross-seed with HETES and HEC can also cross-seed with HELF. And again, HETES cannot cross-seed with uh, HETES. So we perform solid state NMR analysis on, on HEC to see that it keeps also the same uh, beta solenoid uh, architecture. And interestingly, using in vitro cross-seeding analysis, we were able to detect specific position impacted by the cross-seeding. To make a long story short, what we have done is that we carbon-13 label HEC and then we cross-seed HEC with unlabeled HETES or HELF. And then we use a chemical shift analysis to derive chemical shift perturbation on HEC seeded by HETES, by HELF or HEC uh, alone. So using this approach, we could highlight uh, several uh, hotspots for cross-seeding uh, specificity. So it's a point we want to explore in the, in the future by engineering more sequences to try to rationalize uh, this uh, specificity for cross-seeding at the level of the primary sequence and how it affects uh, the structure from a solid state and MR uh, point of view. So our current research focuses on the understanding of amyloid uh, templating. And in an early study in 2015, it was demonstrated that the gene uh, adjacent to HETES encode uh, a protein that uh, have a prion domain and at that time, we used solid state NMR to derive limited information on the secondary structure of this uh, protein using amino acid specific labeling. So the protein is called uh, NWD2. So since 2015, we were able to overexpress the system in E. coli and also to perform isotope labeling. And now we were able to solve uh, its structure, which you can uh, see here. Um, using a uh, carbon-13 uh, uh, detected uh, solid state NMR. Uh, there is one point I want to comment about the, the, the structure and that is really surprising. It is the charge localization. Uh, so you can see that we have uh, E11, arginine 15, also arginine 6. So basically we have a stacking of the same charge along the fibril axis uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a parallel in register arrangement. Uh, it's a kind of surprising since it should be highly defavorable uh, energetically for the stacking, uh, but well, uh, it's working like this and actually we get a perfect non-polymorphic uh, uh, assembly. So we know that uh, many people, and we are also trying to do that, uh, 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 to actually rationalize the design of amyloid sequences. So that's an aspect we are investigating, uh, so how sequence information can be used to predict uh, uh, the prion specificity and the prion uh, structure and for instance to predict how the stacking of charge can allow or cannot allow the formation of, of uh, amyloids. So using the same methodology we also design a chimeric construct to determine at high resolution the heterotypic interface between NWD2 and HETES so by producing a single protein with a sequence that encode the two prion domain so in the same uh, sequence. And we solve uh, the structure uh, uh, by uh, uh, NMR. Uh, importantly, and uh, again, that's very important for us, we have also demonstrated the functionality of our approach by checking that the in vitro fibrils used by NMR can also trigger program self-death and, and prion propagation uh, in vitro. So the, the, the big picture of this project is to be able to propose a model for amyloid-based templating mechanism. So what we propose in this model is that NWD2 uh, would aggregate in a beta-solenoid 
and then recruit HETES to establish a specific heterotyping interface that will trigger the assembly of HETES. So we generate a high resolution model of the complete uh, fibril. So using the high resolution structure of HETES uh, solved by uh, Beat Meyer, our structure of NWD2, NWD2, and then the HETES NWD2 interface we also solve by a solid state and MR. You can see here this, this uh, structural uh, model. So in analogy to the methodology used for health, we are now currently performing a cross-sinning experiment to be able to determine hotspots during the templating process and establish the molecular basis of amyloid refolding upon this uh, uh, templating. So for the last uh, few minutes, uh, uh, let me switch to uh, something that is completely unrelated to functional amyloids. Uh, so we have uh, recently explored the use of proton detection and fast magic angle spinning on intact uh, cryptococcus neoformans uh, cells. So cryptococcus is a major pathogen uh, to human and animals. Uh, it can cause disease to immunocompetent and immunocompromised uh, host. And it has a characteristic structural organization, uh, what you can see here on this, on this image. So you can see the cytoplasm the plasma membrane, the cell wall, and there is, an, uh, there is another unusual uh, surface uh, structure. Uh, so the cell wall is rich in, in polysaccharide and manoproteins, and this uh, unusual structure of the surface is called uh, the capsule, and it's uh, actually a virulence uh, factor. So our idea is to explore what we can do with uh, proton detection and fast magic angle spinning on uniformly labeled cryptococcus uh, cells. So we have established a, a, a great collaboration with Vishu uh, Amananja at uh, Pasteur Institute. Uh, he's an excellent uh, microbiologist uh, for this uh, organism. And after optimization, we obtain uniformly carbon-15, nitrogen-15 label cells that we use directly to fill the solid state NMR rotor. So what you can see here is two-dimensional HCH correlation experiment. So using a cross-polarization step to reveal the rigid molecules on intact cryptococcus cells, so recorded on, on our 800 megahertz uh, spectrometer. So several polysaccharides, they can be identified based on their characteristic chemical shifts, such as uh, alpha-glucan, beta-glucan, or chitin uh, species. However, the resolution is still limited and, and assignment can be very difficult just because, uh, you know, many polysaccharides, they have chemical shifts that are extremely uh, close depending the, the, the branching. At least it's much better with this proton detection compared to the use of, of one-dimensional carbon-13 detected uh, experiment, but that was not enough. So in order to improve the quality and add an additional dimension, we use three-dimensional spectroscopy. So HCCH uh, uh, experiment, so what you can see here, uh, these are the two-dimensional proton-proton planes of the three-dimensional experiment, as well as the two-dimensional carbon-carbon projection. So it was extremely useful since we can navigate uh, from carbon to carbon and then with the additional uh, uh, proton dimension, it helped us a lot uh, actually to assign the uh, spin system. So the signal that I observe using this experiment uh, uh, reveal actually the rigid uh, molecules because we use cross-polarization as polarization transfer. Now, in order to probe the mobile molecule of the system, we use a two-dimensional HEH experiment using a J-coupling uh, to transfer magnetization. So interestingly, uh, using this experiment, we can only probe the capsule uh, structure uh, which has actually typical polysaccharide. It's composed by typical polysaccharide, such as xylose, manose, and, and mostly uh, galactose. So using this spectroscopic dynamic spectral edition, we show that it's possible to specifically identify the polymeric molecules in the capsule compared to the molecules that are in the rigid uh, cell wall. Uh, the capsule is a virulence factor and it is known to, to, to constantly be rearranged as a response to the external environment. So based on our result, we demonstrate the high mobility of the polysaccharide that form the capsule. And we think that this approach will offer an efficient uh, way to explore the composition upon change of the culture condition, could also be the use of mutants 
or if we change the exter ex external environment. And this is something we are currently doing with our colleagues from the uh, uh, Pasteur Institute. Uh, it took us actually some time to understand why several signals in this experiment that reveal the mobile molecule could not be assigned to polysaccharide. And finally, we have identified with high precision, the precision, sorry, those signal to lipids. So, you know, we are a lab and we are doing a lot of uh, study of lipid dynamics by phosphorus and deuterium NMR. So usually as soon as we see a signal, a lipid signal, we are trying to assign it to phospholipid. But it, it, it didn't work here uh, uh, in this case. And finally, after some work, we could assign it. So not to phospholipids, but to triglyceride, okay? So again, I find it amazing to be able to observe with such a very good proton resolution, uh, the complete system of a lipid that is directly embedded inside uh, the cells. So we see the complete spin system with two exceptions. Uh, so what you can see here on the figures between the carbon four and the carbon five, actually we do not know exactly how many CH2 are there, just because there could be that there are different CH2 that have exactly the same proton and the carbon chemical shift. So it's difficult to know exactly using this method, the length of the aliphatic uh, chain, okay. The other thing is between the carbon one and what we call the C2H2, there is an oxygen, so it just cut the, polar, the CC polarization transfer. Otherwise, we are able to establish the spin system assignment along all the uh, molecule. So after a lot of uh, work, uh, we could propose a molecular organization of the cryptococcus surface. So with a cell wall that is rigid, but with molecules that, that can have a well-ordered structure or can be highly polymorphic. This is the case for the chitin uh, molecule, for instance. Uh, we see some lipids in a fluid uh, state. Putatively, we, we think that they are uh, located in uh, lipid uh, droplets. And we do see a capsule that is keeping a high degree of uh, mobility. So the capsule form a dynamic structure uh, that protects cryptococcus by adding another structural layer to interfere with uh, uh, immune response. So in addition, it adds a physical shield okay, to the self, although we have only detected highly mobile species for this uh, to be part of this uh, uh, capsule. So this is something actually we want to explore now with the use of cryptococcus mutants uh, to can, uh, that can actually affect the composition of the capsule and see how we can determine uh, this composition using uh, solid state anymore. Uh, so as a conclusion, there are a few points uh, I want to, to, to discuss. So first we demonstrate that uh, atomic resolution structure of amyloid fibrils could be derived from proton detected solid state anemia and the use of fast magic angle spinning. We also propose a new approach to identify intermolecular restraint based on this asymmetric uh, labeling scheme. From a structural point of view, we establish that it's not the amyloid fall per se that prevent the prion strain formation, but rather the specific evolved sequence of this prion. Uh, we show that despite low sequence identity, two prion homologs form the same backbone structure despite very low sequence uh, identity. But surprisingly, they do not cross in, in vitro and in vivo. Uh, from a biological point of view, uh, uh, natural prions are evolutionarily polished to prevent structural plasticity and prion strain formation because this structural po polymorphism might compromise the advantageous seeding barrier. Again, you have to think about one organism that possesses hundreds of these functional prions and all of them are able to trigger a specific program self-death reaction. And presumably, they are all forming a beta solenoid structure. So there must be a subtle mechanism that is encoded at the level of the primary sequence and also at the level of the structure to allow or to not allow the cross-seeding between uh, all these different uh, functional amyloids from the same organism. And so for cryptococcus, so we have demonstrated that uh, uh, proton detection can be used to identify and to characterize the molecular structure of, of intact uh, cells. Uh, we think that it's a highly promising approach and it's complementary to mass uh, spectrometry and solution NMR that are right now the gold standard to study uh, carbohydrates. 
and so to analyze the composition and the organization of, of this complex uh, uh, organism. So the use of the proton detection uh, takes advantages of, of high sensitivity with respect to the sample quantity. Here again for this analysis, we only use few hundreds microgram of, of uh, samples. I also think that more solid state NMR approaches uh, are required to improve the selective detection of the pathogen surface and we are working on the use of uh, advanced labeling strategy or also combination with uh, DNP uh, methodology to, to help us. And so to finish, I would like to thank so all the present and the past uh, uh, member uh, uh, of the group and also uh, several collaborators. So we have this uh, uh, collaboration uh, with the group of uh, Sven Soap on the different functional amyloid uh, project as well as have a colleague so in Lyon uh, 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 at the CRMN at the Pasteur Institute. And also, uh, I didn't mention that, but actually we cross-check the supramolecular arrangement of health fibrils using mass per lymph measurement. So that's why we have this collaboration with Joe Wall, who is a specialist in mass per lymph uh, measurement. Thank you. Thanks Antoine for the very nice presentation. There are already quite a few questions in the Q&A, so I'll go ahead and read and you can of course also follow along. Um, Paul Shanda says, very interesting uh, talk, a nice LF structure, technical question about the mixed labeling approach to get the intermolecular contacts. You have residual few percent protons on the nitrogen labeled subunits, then the cross peaks may be strong because the distance is short. They may be mistaken for intermolecular context there's some solution NMR membrane protein structures that went wrong with this labeling. Do you check the residual protonation? Did you use more specific? No, 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 no. We, 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 we didn't check the, the residual level of, of protonation. Uh, this experiment is still not extremely sensitive. So we, we were able to extract some intermolecular restraint. Now, if you consider the structure and how many intermolecular restaurant could be potentially extracted, we are still extremely far. So we only extract what was unambiguous for us with, let's say, high intensity on the experiment and probably there are many peaks that could also come from this, uh, let's say, uh, artifact with the uh, labeling. So it's true that we, we, we still, we should be careful when we do this analysis. Thanks. Then the next question looks like it's uh, essentially the same about mixed labeling 5% on deuterium. So I'll skip that one. Um, and then we have, um, does a mixture of deuterated and protonated monomers influence the 3D packing of amyloids? Oh, that's a very good question. At least what was shown for several prion systems and not fungal prion systems is that when you use deterioration, basically it kind of slowed down the aggregation or in some system it even stopped the aggregation. Uh, in our cases, you know, it's a functional amyloid, it's extremely robust. You can change the condition for aggregation, you always get the same structure. So, I mean, this is not something we have checked, but uh, where the, you know, the chemical shift were the same between the protonated and the non-protonated system. So I believe there is no change if we use the iteration. For this system, again, these are extremely robust system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, then um, Franz asks, hi Antoine, in the case of stacking of charged residues, do you have any or do you have specific restraints, e.g. from 50% mixed labeling, or how do you determine the short distances of the same residue on the different monomers? So that is, a, it's a very good question. I guess he's talking about that one. So that one, it's interesting because the, the construction we use is we put two times the same repeat in the same protein. And technically, it's impossible to know what is intermolecular and what is intramolecular because basically it's just a stacking of R0. But actually, at the, at the end, we don't care because this is just a stacking of R0. So as soon as you detect a restraint between R0 and, and R0, it could be intra or intermolecular, but does not matter for the structure determination because it's a completely symmetric assembly. I hope I respond to the question. Maybe, maybe it's about um, getting the shortest 
restraints. So where, where are the restraints in that case? They must be sequential residues or did you use mixed labeling again for that one? For, for, this, for this system? Yeah, so what are the shortest contacts that you measure um, to establish ah, so the parallel and register? Oh. Maybe the question if I guess. So, so the shortest distance, well, you know, we don't use any distant class. So basically we always put everything at eight or eight Amstrom. Uh, of course, at the end, when we check the structure, the, the proton proton proximity might be closer, but we decided to never try to reduce this distant class. Uh, as I say, we are conservative. Sure, they are cross peak with different intensity, but the problem is, you know, with this polarization pathway, we can have a lot of relay contact, so I mean, still very difficult by 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 solid state NMR to do this this high precision distance measurement. So we put everything at uh, 8.5 Armstrong, even if of course they are shorter than 8.5 Armstrong. Thanks. So uh, later on in a more informal session, maybe we can continue if it if it uh, if it didn't answer the question. Then uh, next is an autonomous, anonymous attendee who says, do the cells survive the fast magic angle spinning? I guess it's for well, the- that, that, that is a good question. We, we, we made some tests actually on Cryptococcus and we are also now doing this for other uh, uh, organism. Um, so several tests. Uh, first test is to we fix or we do not fix the cells. And then we record solid state and MR spectra. So we do see that we have the same uh, chemical shift pattern if we fix or if we don't fix the cells. Then we have also made some tests. So we run solid state and MR spectrum. And then after six months, we run on the same rotor, you know, the same sample. And we also do see the same uh, fingerprint. So we think that the cells, they keep their structural integrity. Now, if the question is if the cell they feel happy in the rotor that is spinning extremely fast? Probably not. But what we are checking here is the molecular organization. Anyway, in most of the sample, we fix the cells. So, you know, the functionality is already changed by the fact that we fix the cells. But I believe that the structural organization, the integrity of the cell wall and the capsule is the same because we do see the same chemical shift. Thanks, then uh, Ruth Stark asks, uh, very nice work, first of all, on the difficult uh, crypto cell wall constituents. We too thought at first that our mobile acyl chains belong to phospholipids, but their triglyceride identity became clear and was also sensible with respect to biology. Phew, so maybe it's not a question, maybe it's a statement, I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that, yeah we, we actually, we, we were very happy that uh, they, 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 this is what I have mentioned somewhere here, yeah. Actually, their group and, and the group of Arturo Casadeval uh, also uh, uh, published a study recently using uh, carbon-13 detected uh, solid state NMR, and they were also able to assign the triglyceride. So uh, it was very good for us because, you know, it, if you don't check all the resonances, you can easily make an assignment and say it's a phospholipid. Uh, because, you, you know, you have unsaturated, you have a CH3, you have a CH2. So, yeah, that was a very important cross-check for us that they also published this, uh, this study. Great. Then uh, that's all the questions I understood. There's one last uh, asking for mixed labels. How are you sure about cross-polarization signal for the resonance assignment? Um, not really sure. Uh, so if the one asking that question would want to raise a hand and, and clarify, uh, please do. Although we talked about that on several other questions. Uh, so then let's thank both speakers again and close the uh, formal part and move on to the informal